I am wondering, are there any Masked Lords of Waterdeep that we might have heard of, but, like, the fact that they're a Masked Lord might not actually be well publicized to, to gamers? It might be a little bit of a secret? Yes. Tons <laughs> of them in the, in the 1350s and 60s. Um, a few in the 1490s in, in Waterdeep Dragon Heist that come across to you as just, like, normal people, and I'd say, by that I mean shopkeepers, um, laborers, uh, craft, craft laborers, you know, who, who make nice things and sell them to you, um, or sell them to shops to sell to you. Um, merchant traders, the, the sort of uh, middlemen who um, sell space on a merchant ship, or want you to take this crappy overcargo along with the really good cargo you want for his fee, those sort of people would be mass floors, not senior guild members or guild masters, not nobles. Although there's the occasional rebel young noble, as in the third or fourth son or daughter who doesn't see eye to eye with their parents, whom, whom the masked lords decide it would be really good to have amongst their ranks so they, they can, like, spy on what nobles are chattering about at noble revels and so on and report back to the mass lords, oh, they all think you're idiots for this. So what should we do to rile them? You know, that sort of thing. But but you see, once they start to act like nobles, oh no, we are the rightful rulers of everything because we're smart and rich and tradition and all that stuff, then they're no longer useful to the mass lords as a mass lord. And they usually quietly get told to take a hike. You know, <laughs> can you? Uh, I don't want to make you share too much, but can you give us any names that maybe somebody we would have heard of that that is a masked lord? Again, if you can't answer, it's okay. Well, there was a um, famous trader called Samareza Sulfontis back in the 1350s, and Samareza was a masked lord for a short period. Interesting. Not very long. Awesome. Yes. Um, Brian the Swordmaster. Oh, okay. Um, also yeah. in the 13 uh, was a a uh, masked lord for a short period. They tended to be people who went in thinking, I am not making a career of this. I'm going to stay as a mass lord for a couple of years to get something I want pushed through into law because I don't like the way things are heading, so I'm going to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. But I'm not a career politician. It's that sort of attitude. Yeah, there are quite a few. I mean, this is kind of actually in the, in the same vein. It what about Mert, right? So now in the late 1490s DR, especially those that have paid, played Dragon Heist, know that Mert is a masked lord, isn't he? But he's not, not so masked, yes. correct? Yes, yeah, okay. Mert, uh, back in the day, and again, we're going to the 1350s, okay? 1350s DR, Mert is a masked lord. And he doesn't care who knows it. And he says, oh yes, I'm a masked lord. Everybody goes, yeah, yeah, easy to claim. But don't know. Um, what he would do is he'd say, look, if there's something you want the mass lords to decide on, tell me, and we'll decide on it at the next meeting. And this happened over and over again until people realized he's telling the truth. He really is a mass lord. Good. He's a conduit. And what that meant was they could say, look, I can't march up to the open lord in Pure Guren's actual palace, because Pure Guren was the open lord in those days, and say, you guys are so full of poo that I want to take all your heads and stick them up on pikes. And this is why you're doing this, this, and this. But you could go to Mert and say, hey, Mert, don't throw your flag at me, but you know you lords are full of poo, <laughs> and here's why. And, and Mert would sit down and say, tell me. And it, he was a very useful safety valve and a way of going back to the mass forwards and saying, you know what they're saying out in the streets? They're saying that you eat babies. So if you want to go on being thought of eating as baby, just go on as you are. But if you don't want to be thought of that way, we might want to say or do something. So he was, he had established that role for himself. And then he got caught in the blue flame item and a century went past and he came back out of it. And as far as he's concerned, he's still a mass lord. No one ever stripped him of the thingy and, and in fact you know he reappears he he goes to his house and Laryl's living in it 
<laughs> you know, because yeah. he's presumed yeah. dead. And and the city has taken over his mansion and is using it as a residence for the open lord because the open lord then doesn't have to live in the palace, which means the mass lords can conveniently get the open lord out of the way when they want to discuss the open lord um, in the, as not being in front of her. And so, you know, it's one of those marvelous scenes where Mert strips off all his clothes and pads through the uh, to, to have a bath, and it's like he opens the thing for his favorite fluffy robe, and it isn't there. Instead, there's a whole bunch of feminine undergarments. It's like, <laughs> I don't recall taking up cross-dressing sort of thing. Wait a minute. You know, and then, then Laryl says, I don't recall ha inviting a hairy naked man into my bedchamber either. And he turns around and says, this is my house. No, it's, oh, hello, Murd. Yes, <laughs> yes, it is your house. <laughs> a lot of time has passed. Yeah, that sort of thing. But he felt quite comfortable in continuing this role. Now, the current mass Lords are of two minds of what to do about this guy. Here's this old rip who hasn't been on the scene. He suddenly reappeared. He still thinks he's a mass Lord. He still thinks he's one of the, you know, major mass Lords. And they don't bloody know him for anything. He's this crazy old man. But he's working hand in glove with Laryl, and Laryl likes him It's just, and, and uses him as a sort of overweight, wheezing, elderly James Bond secret agent to go and do stuff for. So it's fascinating because when Laryl is your open lord and you you sort of begged her to, to take the role after you booted Dagalt Neverember out, you know, and there's potential war with Neverwinter and you want to avoid that. So you bring in um, somebody that everybody knows is one of Mistress Chosen and a gorgeous woman so that hopefully people won't throw things at her just to get her attention. Because it's like, oh, yeah, I dare not treat this particular individual like this. Therefore, the open lord role gets some respect. And when then she chums up with Elminster to be her head of secret police and security and Mert to be her James Bond agent, it's like, well, I guess we'll just let this Mert guy do what he wants because, <laughs> uh-oh, guess who's backstopping him? Because, you know, we invited this dragon into our midst as open lord. Wait a minute, there's an iron fist inside that velvet glove. You know, <laughs> so they're, 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 they're treating Mert with care and Mert is being Mert. You know, Mert is the guy who walks in and says, well, here's another fine mess you've gotten your city into. If you weren't all such dolts and you didn't want to, you know, um, go out and, and attack people in the middle of the night because you don't like their noses, then we wouldn't be in this situation. But because you are such dolts and clots, we are. So what are you going to do about it? He can actually walk in and talk like that. And although they don't like it, they are also beginning to see the usefulness of it because Mert can say, look, you guys can gossip all night. We have to get this done. We have to get it done in tonight. So let's do it right now. Let's do the unpleasant thing first, gentlemen, shall we? Uh, you know, and, and he can talk like that and he's useful. He's like the bull in the China shop. If you want the China shop shattered, you send in the bull. And Mert is fulfilling that role and therefore... Uh, for Dungeon Masters, he's going to be a lot of fun to run. Yeah, and actually, you know what? To me, that says a lot about the the moral fortitude of Waterdeep in general to be that heavily influenced by the Harpers, right? To have that kind of close affiliation and somebody that's, you know, uh, so inc uh, instrumental in the Harpers to be at a level of power like that in Waterdeep. Speaking of the identities of Masked Lords, though, I am curious how you feel about them being kind of widely shared and publicized. Like, do you think that it's better something left somewhat vague in the official publications to let DMs and GMs kind of, uh, you know, suss it out for themselves? Or do you think that there's value in those NPCs being revealed to the gaming table? I, I think for many Dungeon Masters, there would be value in having two or three of them known. But yes, I think the main utility is to keep a voting minority and perhaps a majority of mass Lords up to the Dungeon Master, left as a mystery. Because then power gamers can't manipulate them with the ease that power gamers like to manipulate things at. 
and I'm not saying this disparagingly to power gamers, it takes away a lot of the fun. It's sort of like, yeah, if you want to if you want to enjoy a good murder recipe, but you have the magical power of reading everybody's minds, it's going to be very hard to resist reading minds and solving the mystery. And you you've robbed yourself a lot of the fun. If, as player characters, you know who the Masked Lords are and you could bully them or kill them or whatever, kidnap them so they can't be there for votes or whatever, you're taking away a lot of the fun. If it's a mystery and you have to role-play and tread carefully, then it's a lot more fun. So, yeah, as a dungeon master, I would recommend as a design principle that a, that a substantial number of Masked Lords always be left up to the DM. We don't know who they are. And, of course... I'll say it again, mass lords can be all ages, all genders, all races. Now, think of it this way. As I said before, they tend to favor folks like us. So it's going to be very, very hard to get any of them to agree to a mind flayer or a drow being made, named, voted in, elected a fellow mass lord. No! Heavens no! And they are going to favor people like us being, oh, Water Davians of wealth and long standing, but that they that's the this is the other thing you have to remember. And this is the the worst part of racism in the real world, when people begin to think of a group as monolithic, because they end up speaking with one voice through the open lord, they think they're all in accord. The mass lords fight like cats and dogs behind closed doors. So the nepotism is kept down by Oh, no, you're not letting your niece, I don't care if your niece is the best, you know, counter of gold lions in, in, in all Toril. She's your niece. So we're not letting her anywhere near. No, 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 no. I'm not unless we put two of my nieces in. Then I'll agree to your one niece. And then everybody else goes, wait a minute. And he says, see? You know, and so they, they, they guard against nepotism by fighting with each other. And, of course, that's what Agarin wanted. He wanted the street sweeper, the dung carter, to be next to the wealthy wannabe noble and saying, uh, like the, 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 the little scene in Game of Thrones at the end of it where they're having the last meeting of the small council and the lords are bickering, you know, about whether they're going to open the brothels or not or, you know, and where the, where the money's going to come from because they... St- do, they do not come from the same backgrounds, and they do not see eye to eye. That's how the masked lords operate. Yeah, you actually answered one of my my next questions, actually, which was it was about. Sorry. No, no, you're good. That's that's. It was a great explanation. It was about nepotism. Like I, I was curious, you know, because it's kind of such a clandestine uh, endeavor being a masked lord. If that they want, if it becomes somewhat insular sometimes, if people, you know what I mean, bring in their friends or, or bring in their relatives, but it sounds like it's, it's self-policing in a way, which is a really interesting dynamic. Well, they do bring in their friends, yes, but they don't get to bring in their relatives, close kin, usually. Now, if somebody says, oh, so-and-so is actually your 16th cousin, well, I mean, if that accusation is made behind closed doors, the masked lord that it's being made to, their best play is probably to say, they are? Jeez, I can't keep track of all so-and-so's children and who they slept with. You know, look, look, I just I just said it because they're the best operator of, you know, left-headed slingshots in the kingdom or whatever. You know, um, you, you want it to be like that. And again, you can role-play all this. I mean, this could be a juicy role-playing thing. What if some masked lords fear for their lives. So they go and hire the player characters to be their stand-ins and attend the meetings on their behalf because they think someone's going to try and assassinate them in the next little well. So just for the next 10 day, could you attend all the meetings? And I've got this hired wizard here who's going to make you look just like me and that mass lord and that mass lord. So you're all going to attend and uh, we want you to vote in a block, you know, sort of thing, you know. And then they come in, you know, the, the, you could you could role play these fights. The, the, these, the, uh, it's never an open brawl. And of course, that's the other reason they chose Laryl. Because they're hoping that if it comes to an open brawl at a, 
private, behind closed doors, mass lords meeting, Lara will just sort of go, you, boom, and you, boom. You can sit frozen in your chairs until you can agree not to draw steel on your companions. Heavens, we're supposed to be solving the problems of the city, not creating new ones. Behave, you know, sort of thing. And and that, that's sort of a side bit of having Lara there. But yeah, you can role play all of these debates and fights. And guess what? You know when they talk about how role playing prepares you for real life? This is a prime example. Role playing is preparing you for running your local municipal small town or village council. Or perhaps, I don't know, the city of Chicago or New York or LA and, and deciding its things, you know, and, and, and or just the boardroom. In, in, and, and, you know, when you get into that situation and you think, uh oh, then you go, wait a minute. This is just like that time we role played. Yeah, I got this. <laughs> so that actually kind of leads into my next question. I am curious about that decision making process and how generally fair it is. So, you know, you, you said that it's kind of all walks of life, and I think that's really admirable in the selection of the Masked Lords. But do you think that their inher inherent power and often, you know, sometimes no inherent nobility and wealth leads them to make decisions that would sometimes favor maybe the wealthy or the well-off, or is it pretty objective? Uh, yes, the tendency is to favor the status quo in Waterdeep and therefore support the people on top at the moment who are in turn either noble or wealthy or both. Yes, so that's the tendency. And that's where having those fights behind closed doors comes in. And that's also where what really happens on the ground, at least in my Home Realms campaign's version of Waterdeep, is the nobles are on this side. And they're not monolithic. They fight. Their feuds among the nobles are far bitterer than anything else. And the guildmasters are over here on this side. And they have feuds with each other. And, hey, that, that should be part of my guild, not part of your guild, sort of thing. And then there are the wannabe nobles and the wannabe wealthy merchant princes who um, don't want the guilds getting in the way of them getting into everything. Like, for instance... Um, to put this in real-world terms, imagine Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates or Elon Musk or anybody else who invests in many things and who changes the rules of particular marketplaces or, or industries running into entrenched unions who say, nope, you can't change things. We have agreements. Well, imagine those sort of fights going on all the time. Some, the, the maverick, the, the new guy may win on some cases, like uh, you could argue that the two Steves, when starting Apple, people found the computer just so cool that they were able to do things with it. You know, it, at times it was a, a product in search of an audience or in search of a use, and people just, oh, this is wonderful, sort of thing. But then there are times when they run up against real-world things, like part shortages, uh, shortages of precious metals for batteries and circuit boards and so on. And you just run into the... And that's what happens behind closed doors with the masked lords. So it works again and again, even before you follow a Garen's, well, make sure you've got a Dung Carter in there. Make sure you've got a beggar and a prostitute from the streets. Because she'll sit there, that prostitute, or maybe it's a him, you know, uh, will sit there in their seat and look across the table, the ring table at a masked lord who's like got rings on all of his fingers and gems everywhere and say you bastard. And now you want to do you want to do this? Well obviously you want to do it to enrich yourself further. So I'm going to block you just because you are more than rich enough. It's about time that we got a square meal this side of the in, in the mean streets. And those fights go on behind closed doors all the time. Which in this case is why Laryl is looking older and older by the day. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that'll, that'll age a person pretty quick. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of things going on behind closed doors, my last question for today is: I'm I'm curious if there are any kind of exciting or and or secret plots, um, and maybe 
interesting bits of intrigue that uh, might have been or are currently being carried out by the Masked Lords that the auto, that the average Water Davian or uh, and obviously the average gamer might not know. Sure. Okay. I'm not going to identify specific ones. I'm just going to hand the Dungeon Master the notion that from Egeron onwards to the present day, knocking on the door of 1,500 DR the year, this has been happening over and over again, that the Masked Lords have selected guild masters behind the scenes without the guild necessarily seeing their hand in the pie. They have dismissed guild masters. They have disgraced guild masters, so they lost power within their guild, and they've done the exact same thing to noble houses. Heads of noble houses, matriarchs and patriarchs who were known to have, shall we say, personal desires and habits that made them dangerous to fellow citizens of the city and and or just rapacious. Like, they love to financially humble somebody until they were a beggar and then seize their properties. Okay, it's about time we stop that behavior. So the mass lords wouldn't openly fight the noble lord, but they'd start manipulating things behind the scenes so that that noble lord's plans would go awry and it would cost them lots of money. And every single time they set out to destroy somebody, it would backfire in their faces. So there's, those sort of things are going on all the time. And those are the things that you can build a campaign around. It can be the meat and potatoes meta plot. And of course, one of the ways the mass lords would do this without their own hands getting caught in the pie is to dupe, manipulate, or hire adventurers from outside the city, like, I don't know, the player characters, to wittingly or unwittingly do something that gets in the way of a guild master or the head of a noble house or just a big bad noble who misbehaves all the time. You know, the black sheep of a particular noble family who just, okay, it's time for this person to get their codpiece caught in the dung cart, which is a, a local <laughs> saying. <laughs> That's a hell of a colloquialism. <laughs> yeah. It, and, and of course, what it comes from is a famous scene where a, a noble who was portly from too much wine and too little work um, tried to <laughs> leap over a dung cart to get away from pursuers and didn't. It splash, <laughs> slide. And then he, he, he ended up hanging half out of the dung cart, but he couldn't get free of the dung cart because his codpiece was caught on the side of the dung cart. So, yeah, th that became a local like, thing. Don't get your dung piece caught in the coat. Yeah. Uh, uh, your codpiece yeah. caught in the dung cart. Uh -huh.